For this lesson we're going to be taking a look at something known as composition of functions. And this is really, despite the fact that it's only one lesson, this is kind of the heart of, of this unit in the sense that what we were looking at before, combinations of functions, adding, subtracting, multiplying, dividing, etc. Those are all valid and they're all important in their own way. But now we get into the idea of a function that actually contains another function as its argument. And you can see I've, I've started off here with y equals 2 to the power sine x. And so what we're going to do is take a look at the question of how would we end up, let's just say, graphing this. And I've made it a little bit unrealistic but for the purposes of this discussion we need to start this way where I say your calculator can only perform a single operation and that's actually true of some calculators but for many of you you have a more sophisticated calculator than that so let's take a look at how would we do our table of values in order to do this so the first thing we would do is if I want to come up with some values for 2 to the sine of x, what I'm going to have to do is first of all fill out some values for the exponent here for sine of x. So my first table of values, I'm going to find some values of x and I'll find some values of sine x. And I'm not going to, I, this is not meant to really drag out, so I'll do 0, 1, 2, and 3. So I start off, I could have also made my life a little bit easier. I could have chosen, for example, um, values that I know were going to work out nicely for taking the sign, but this is fine. I'm going to get some decimal values and that's okay. So that means I'm going to start off with the sine of zero, and the sine of zero, as it turns out, is just equal to zero. And then I'm going to take the sine of 1. And making sure, in this case, I'm working in radians. So the sine of 1 is equal to 0 0.8415. At least it's approximately equal to that. Here I have the sine of 2. Sine of 2, which is equal to 0 0.9093. And the sine of 3, which is equal to 0 0.1411, 0 0.1411. Now that I have those values, I need to take some x values, and I have to imagine the function... Well, actually, let's not take x values. I need to now take 2 to the power sine of x. So what x values am I going to put in here? Well, let's call these my x2 values. But these x2 values are actually going to be the values of sine x. So let's actually rewrite this a little bit. We're going to call this 2 to the power x2. And these are going to be the values that I just calculated for sine. 8, 4, 1, 5, 0 0.9093, 0 0.1411. I'm just going to recalculate that sine of 3 just. And the sine of 2. Just going to check all of these sine of 1. And of course, sine of 0 is equal to 0, that one I'm confident about. So now what I end up with is 2 to the 0. And 2 to the 0 is equal to 1. I end up with 2 to the 0 0.8415, which is approximately equal to, and that's 2 to the power 0.8415, and I end up with 1.79. And then I get 2 to the power 0 
0 0.9093 and I end up with 1.88 and 2 to the power 0 0.1411 2 to the power 1 oh clear that 2 to the power 0 0.1411 and that one's equal to 1.10 so now I get my overall my final values after I put these in now if I did these all in my calculator I would end up with the same results the important thing that I want us to recognize is that my x values are here and my final values my y values are here so my table of values in the end is going to end up looking like this y equals 2 to the sine of x my x values are going to be 0, 1, 2, 3. And my y values for this are going to be 1, 1 1.79, 1.88, 1.10. And the important thing is to recognize that middle step that we had to take, which is we had to calculate the value of sine x, which was the value from the, in this case, in the exponent. And then I had to use the result of this as my, my input into my exponential function. And that's really what we're going to be looking at here in a more formal way which is this idea I use the word input there one of the ways that I sometimes describe a function is I talk about the function as a machine you don't actually have to know what's going on inside the machine all you need to know is that the machine accepts some sort form of input the input goes into the machine and some sort of processing takes place and then the machine provides you with some sort of output which is the answer it is possible to take multiple machines or functions and chain them together so that you take your first input into the first machine and then the output of the first machine becomes the input to the second machine and that result is your final output and the analogy for machines here is because when you think about it that's how a, a mass production factory works you take raw material Let's see if I can get a colored pen here so we take some raw material and we input that and then a part way through we've changed the raw material into something that's no longer raw material but it's not not a final product anymore but eventually we get to the point where we have some sort of final product and so that's the analogy for a machine is not is not a terrible one it's actually quite applicable here now how this gets laid out is quite important we need to be very careful about what is our first input what is our second input and that gets down to the definition of a composition of functions. So a composition of functions is when you have a function of another function. So in other words, the argument of one function is actually an entire second function. So the way I like to break these down is I like to think of what is the outer function and what is the inner function the way that you denote this f composed with g of x or f of g of x that ordering of the composition is going to tell you what's the inner and what's the outer function so in this case the outer function is the one you'll read first the inner function is the one that you read last and you can do multiple compositions we're not going to be looking at much in the way of more than two but technically you could have three or four or five 
2 is hard enough for most of us. So here g of x is going to be the inner function so we have to evaluate those values first and then those values are going to get fed into f. To go back to our little example that we had to start I had 2 to the power sine of x so in that case what I had was my inner function that would have been g of x equals sine of x and then my outer function f of x which was equal to 2 to the x and another way of looking at this if we said f of g of x that's the same as 2 to the x but instead of 2 to the power x that's 2 to the power g of x and then g of x itself was equal to sine x so we end up all the way back at 2 to the power sine of x in this case I'm taking f of x equals the square root of x and g of x is equal to the polynomial x squared minus 4 so f of g of x which is the same as f of g of x that's the same as f and what I have here for g of x is x squared minus 4 so you can see what I've done here what I'm saying is for the function f instead of having an x value here I'm actually going to use this function g of x which is x squared minus 4 now you could have gone from either of these two points from here I get f of g of x well that's equal to what is f f is square root so that's the square root of g of x and then that joins up again with this one because f of x squared minus 4 is the square root of x squared minus 4 so how you choose to visualize this is up to you both of these are a valid path to get there now what if I reverse the order g of f of x it's not the same thing at least it's not usually the same thing there are some very rare cases where it actually will give you the same result but it's not going to here g of f of x is the same as g with f of x as the argument but that's the same as g but f of x is the square root of x so that's g of the square root of x and now I go back to my outer function g and wherever I see an x I'm going to replace it with a square root of x so instead of x squared I put square root of x all squared minus 4 but the square root of x all squared is equal to and this is a subtle one a lot of people will just write this you could write this two ways you could just go ahead and say this is equal to x minus 4 but if you do that this can only ever be a positive value and so you end up having to put a restriction on this which is that x must be greater than 0 and that restriction exists here right we know that because f of x was our inner function we already had a restriction that x must be greater than 0 just in the same way technically this one has a restriction as well which is that x squared minus 4 must be greater than or equal to 0 and actually I should have said that here x must be greater than or equal to 0 another way that you'll sometimes see this represented is sometimes people will write this as when you have the square root of x all squared that's the absolute value of x because the square root of x had to be something positive and so when you square it you end up having to get when you take a positive value and you square it you have to end up with a positive as well it still has the same restriction though 
technically we should not be putting in values of x that are that are negative in this case so I prefer this first way of looking at it. it's more straightforward this absolute value notation doesn't actually add anything in this case in either case you just do have to remember you have to remember this restriction okay now continuing with this now we're going to keep going we're going to focus on f of g of x create a table of values for f of g of x so we're going to go through a similar exercise to what we did before but the big purpose of what we're doing here and I want to is this we are trying to focus on the domain of f of g of x that didn't work quite the way I had hoped let's see if I can make that better determining the domain of f of g that's our purpose for doing this table of values it's not for the purpose of graphing so let's start off with and I've already pre-built some of this to help us get started let's start off with a table of values I've chosen these x values and I've chosen them for a reason these will work out nicely to illustrate um, how we're going to get to D and some of the thinking we need to do so we're going to start off with G of negative 3 and I put that in here negative 3 all squared is 9 minus 4 is equal to 5 here I have G of negative 2 negative 2 all squared is 4 minus 4 is 0 negative 1 all squared is 1 minus 4 is negative 3 0 all squared is 0 minus 4 is negative 4 1 all squared is 1 minus 4 is negative 3 2 all squared is 4 4 minus 4 is 0 and 3 squared is 9 minus 4 is equal to 5 and that was the inner function so don't forget we're doing here f of g of x so g of x is the inner function so that's why we did g of x first but these values are actually what we're now going to put into f for example if I want to know f of g at negative 3 I have to figure out g of negative 3 which I did here g of negative 3 is equal to 5 and then I use that value that 5 so g of negative 3 is 5 and then I find f of 5 so f of g of negative 3 is the same as finding f of 5 and f of 5 is simply equal to the square root of 5 then I take this value of 0 f of 0 is equal to the square root of 0 which is just equal to 0 this is where things get interesting from an illustration point of view f of negative 3 is the square root of negative 3 which is undefined and that's something important we're going to come back to that later same thing happens here for negative 4 we end up with undefined for negative 3 we end up with undefined for 0 square root of 0 is equal to 0 and for 5 square root of 5 is just I'm just going to leave it at its exact value which is root 5 now that would be all well and good if all we were going to do is graph but the reason for doing this was so we could answer part D which is what is the domain of the composition f of G and I just want to remind you so what do I mean by domain which is essentially that is what are all valid X values and the important thing of course here is valid all valid x values and so if we take a look what we're essentially looking for 
are values, x values, that don't cause us a problem here when it, when it, once everything is passed all the way through the entire combination of functions, the composition of functions. So where do we run into problems? Well, we're obviously running into problems here. And actually, the problems would start as soon as we got here to 0. So 0 is OK, and this 0 is OK. But everything on either side of that 0 is not OK, because that's going to give us the square root of a negative number. And that means that this 0 is OK, which means this negative 2 is OK. But everything below that is going to give us so that's no good. Everything down here is no good. Same thing is true. This passes all the way here. And this positive 2 is OK. But everything in between is not. And so this has to be restricted. Because this is going to give the undefined results. And so what we end up with and this one, despite the fact that I think that what we're doing here is, this is a pretty complicated idea. To put this into practice, I've actually chosen a fairly simple example in the sense that it works out quite nicely that the domain of the composition is X member of R such that, and so what are we allowed to have? We're allowed to have values that are on this side of negative 2 including negative 2 so that's x less than or equal to negative 2 or this side of positive 2 including positive 2 which would be written that way or if you want to be really slick about it f of g equals x member of r and we could roll out our absolute value notation and say that x, the absolute value of x must be greater than or equal to 2. Which is saying I have to be at least two units away from the origin. Which is either two units away in the positive direction or two units away in the negative direction. Just show you a quick little number line to remind you of what I've done there. So what I'm saying is it includes this and it's to the right. It includes this and it's to the left. And if you remember our absolute value notation, that's also the same thing as saying absolute value of x greater than or equal to 2. I still think that this is perfectly good to do it this way, but that would be acceptable as well. Here's what the graph of that looks like. It doesn't look particularly fancy but it's how we arrived at it. Let's see if I've got a, some other labels. I don't. Okay. So how we arrived at it, the fact that it includes this point and it includes this point, but nothing in between negative 2 and 2. So just a quick summary, when we're determining the domain of the composition f of g, what we actually want to do is we want to start with the range or the output of g of x. I just want to remind you, so here's what the table of values was that we started with. So we did this table of values, and then over here, we took the values for g of x and we put them into f of x. So what it's essentially saying is, tell me what the possible values are here. That's step number one. Then determine the input of f of x. Well, that's just taking this group and moving them here. That's step number two. So that's one and two are essentially the same thing. And then really what you need to do then is figure out 
which of these values go through here and end up requiring a restriction. And then what we end up having to do is we take that all the way around to the beginning and we restrict so in other words, if we find out that we end up with a restriction between here and here, then that means we have to restrict the output of g of x, which means we end up restricting something on the input of x. And this is not a trivial idea. This is something you're going to need to spend some time with to, uh, to fully appreciate. And even then, there's still going to be ones that you're going to struggle with. Okay, that's it for the lesson. I'm giving you one kind of solid example to work from, but there are more different types of examples than I could possibly illustrate for you. So, really important. Try a variety of these questions, and I would even recommend where I've asked you to do different parts within a question. If you go through this easily enough, take a look at all parts to all of these questions. I really expect this is the most challenging lesson in this particular unit.